Heroes and villains. The medieval world is full of both. Today we're talking Tostic Godwinson. That's coming up. Tostic Godwinson is a very interesting character. I think he's a, a fascinating person. There's so much to him and I think he's as much to an extent a, a, a victim of circumstance as anything else. In those days in, in medieval history it just wasn't possible to put up your hand and say you know what I'm not this isn't the right job for me. Whether you liked it or not, this was it. And your ability to do your job very much affected your family and your wider community. So um, putting his hand up to say that leadership wasn't for him wasn't an option. Tostic is a fascinating character. Let's take a look. Tostic was the third son of Earl Godwin and his wife, Geethan Thorgensaw. I'm, I'm sorry for my pronunciation, I don't speak Old English. And Tostic was married to a lady called Judith of Flanders. This is critical to this story um, and the story of the Godwins in general. But we'll come back to Judith a few times in a series of videos that we're doing at the moment on the Godwins, on William Duke of Normandy and the ultimate invasion of England. Interestingly, what has happened in Around the time of 1051 is uh, Edward the Confessor, the king at the time, invites, uh, elects, elects uh, Robert of Jumierge as Archbishop. There is a, uh, if you like, the Saxon earls at this time and many of the Saxon clerics reacted very negatively to this. They saw the Norman influence of uh, Edward the Confessor as being very negative for Saxon England. Edward the Confessor had been in exile in Normandy, mostly Normandy anyway, for 25 years. As a result, he had many, many long-term friends who were Normans. And I think that the Normans were very loyal to William Duke of Normandy. I don't think that uh, Edward the Confessor really realised that or could contemplate how much of an effect that was going to have. Eustace of Boulogne, uh, Edward's brother-in-law, arrives uh, in England and an affray occurs. Now we, I, I use the word arrive very loosely. It was as much as anything an invasion. He arrived with a large force of soldiers who were all well armed and well equipped and well armoured. And there was an affray with the town's burgesses. Now, a burgess is basically a townsfolk or, or a citizen and member of a town. Uh, news of this reaches Edward the Confessor, the king, and Edward orders Earl Godwin, that is Tostic's father, to bring the town to order and apply the law. There is a standoff because Earl Godwin refuses Earl Godwin could see what had happened and he could see, I believe, um, essentially how this had been manipulated and manufactured as an event by the Normans to gain greater influence in England. At this time, the Godwins controlled a large portion of England and the king himself had a very little power base. That said, um, loyalty is a big thing and what then happened, what then occurred was there was this standoff. Earl Leofric and Earl Seward on one side with the king, with their forces, 
and Earl Godwin on the other with his forces. Earl Godwin's men didn't want to fight the king. That would be treason and end in death, regardless of how it occurred. So the Godwin family now flees. Uh, they're now cast into exile and they lose their titles, their estates and their positions. I think it's um, obvious really that Judith of Flanders um, helped to negotiate safe passage and also uh, safe conduct for them. She also would have been instrumental in arranging accommodation and facilitating the Godwins. However, within a fairly small amount of time, within less than a year, roughly 10 months, the Godwins are returned. The, the Earls, Leofric and Swad had seen that if the king could do this to the most powerful earl in the nation, then he could do it to anybody. What then happens is a, a bit of a crisis, really. The French uh, and the Norman aristocrats and clergy and other people who were in the court of the king, Edward the Confessor, now flee. That included people like Robert de Jumiège, who kidnaps Tostic's youngest brother and also nephew. Uh, and these Normans all flee back to Normandy. I imagine they would have gone to see the Duke at some point, that is Duke William, and told a, a, a tale of how they were oppressed and, and whatnot. But uh, it's important to understand that Robert de Jumiège at this point was um, Archbishop, and it's, it's really for him in that position to be murdering people and to be kidnapping young children it's it's pretty diabolical uh, to say the least this is a, a a very manipulative person to you know as i say to say the least um radio however the godwins are restored to their positions earl godwin then dies within a few weeks and harold godwinson uh, succeeds him as earl of wessex Harold's brother Gerth succeeds Alfgar in East Anglia. Alfgar replaces Leofric in as Earl of Mercia. Lufwan, who's I think one of the younger brothers of uh, the Godwins, he gets to be Earl of South East England. So the, the Godwins now control far more of England through their earldoms than the king does, and they have the power base. In fact, it's fair to say that the Godwins essentially controlled all of England except for Mercia. And this is a fact that probably wouldn't have been lost on the king, but the king at this stage was a very old man and he was a bit sick too. Probably realising his time was up. But uh, we'll talk about Edward the Confessor in a different video. So Earl Tostic is now... Uh, gains his earldom in Northumbria. I think it's fairly obvious at this point, and we're only really a few years away from the uh, Battle of Hastings, Tostig is not a natural leader. He, he doesn't understand uh, politics. He doesn't understand um, how to be a statesman. He has a very interesting population. It's a mix of, uh, I guess, Celtic Britons, Romano Britons, or what's left of those. There's some Anglo-Saxons, and there's obviously Norse settlers who've been there for many generations at this stage. Tostic uh, employs a substantial number of Danish mercenaries to work for him as what are called Huskars. We'll talk about that in a different video. Tostig is directly linked to the deaths of over 200 people, um, including a variety of leading Northumbrian leaders. When he murders uh, Gamel, who's son of Orman, Ulf, it, the word reaches King uh, Edward the Confessor. Tostig has shown a lack of decisiveness and leadership, uh, particularly against revolting uh, Scots. And invading and raiding Scots, I should say. Uh, he's shown a lack of decisiveness and leadership against raiding Scots, as well as uh, invasions on other aspects of his borders. Tostig uh, is drawn into a considerable fight with the Welsh, but of course, wars cost money. 
not only in personnel, but in terms of food, transport, horses, weapons, armor, equipment, uh, all sorts of different things have to be paid for, um, especially food. And to pay for his war in Wales, Tostig had to raise his taxes. So where he was Earl in Northumbria, the Northumbrians had enjoyed a very low tax rate, which was, I, I guess, um, a, a spin-off from the days of the Dane Law, which was created by uh, Alfred the Great. So Tostig's answer to this is to raise the taxes to in line with the rest of England, which was a substantial raise in tax. This now caused a rebellion throughout Mercia. And many of Tostig's advisors and leaders are slaughtered and murdered. The rebels meet with um, Earl Morcar and his brother Edwin, the Earl of Mercia, and they demand that Tostig is replaced by um, they demand Tostig is replaced by Morcar. Morcar was the brother of Edwin, the Earl of Mercia, and also the nephew of Lady Godiva. Yes, the very famous Lady Godiva, who's famous for riding a horse through Coventry uh, in a protest against taxes. Okay, um, on the 3rd of October, 1065, there's a meeting takes place with Harold Godwinson, that's Tostig's eldest brother, and Earl Edwin. They negotiate a peace. However, Tostig accuses Harold of conspiring with the rebels in Wales, but things have already gone way too far. Tostig has been directly associated with more than 200 murders. And Tostig is put into exile in France. He goes with his wife to Flanders. Um, it's a little bit complicated with some murders that occur. However, uh, obviously whilst he's in Flanders, Tostig is uh, talking with people like Duke William, amongst others, who have their eye on the English throne. It needs to be remembered that at this point, we're only months away now from the Battle of Hastings and Edward the Confessor was a very, very sick old man. And the throne was ripe for the plucking because there was no direct successor. In May, 19, in May 1066, Tostig invades the Isle of Wight. This is a, a really strange move. I, I can't see any tactical value in such an invasion. It doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. Um, there isn't a great deal written about it, but we do know that obviously um, chaos ensued as, as would be expected. Tostic raids various armories and uh, so on for the local fjords. He raids um, places where they would be minting money and coin. He steals treasures from churches. He raids up the English coastline through Norfolk and Lincolnshire, but is decisively defeated by Earl Morcar and Edwin. Now, um, Tostig now flees to Malcolm of Scotland. Malcolm um, hosts Tostig for a time, and then there was discussions about the English throne and how that might work. Um, and Tostig seems to head across to Norway to have discussions with Harold Hadrada, amongst other people. Not very long after, the Battle of Fulford Bridge occurs. Uh, Tostig returns a few months later and is joined by some thousands, reportedly, of uh, Scottish raiders. Interestingly, the Scots are descended from a band called the Scoots from Ireland, who were basically pir piratical raiders. Uh, Harold Hadrada and Tostig raid south with around about uh, 10 to 11,000 soldiers. We don't know the precise numbers, but there were a, a sizable, sizable force. Most uh, villages surrender fairly quickly, um, given that. 
the ferocity of these raids and the burning of villages had occurred. Earl Morcar and Earl Edwin are defeated at Fulford Bridge. York more or less peacefully surrenders. It seems that uh, Tostick, perhaps in his, uh, um, in his ignorance as a leader, I don't know, but he kept uh, some of his Flemish and Norwegian and Scottish mercenaries at Stamford Bridge to negotiate the surrender of the English and to um, exchange hostages and treasure. Whilst Harold Hadrada had moved a large portion of his army, more than one third, to guard the ships. This was many miles away. It was an incredibly hot day when the uh, Battle of Stamford Bridge took place on the 25th of September, 1066. And many of these so-called Vikings and mercenaries would not have been wearing armour. The battle went on for much of the day. It started when the Saxons appeared out of the forest, gleaming like the first rays of sunshine, or light through ice, as it was, I think, could have described. We now have a, a crisis because uh, a very sizable Saxon army had marched incredibly quickly in just a matter of four or five days from London to Samford Bridge. That's a hectic distance. Um, and to march at that speed would have taken incredible um, logistical knowledge and power on the behalf of Earl, um, Earl Harold Godwinson. So here's another demonstration, really, of, of Harold Godwinson's leadership. What then happens is, uh, basically, at some point early in the battle, Harold Hadrada takes an arrow to the throat and dies as a result of his wound. Tostick seems to have been slaughtered by his brother, Harold Godwinson, and the battle is essentially lost. A great slaughter then occurs as the Saxons pursue the Vikings and others and eventually the slaughter is called off and just really a, quite a small number of, of Vikings return back to Norway and in the eyes of many historians that's the end of the so-called Viking Age. I don't think there's a great deal of legacy to be discussed in terms of, how, uh, in terms of Tostig Godwinson he was just really a guy who wasn't fit for purpose. He wasn't capable of leading. He wasn't capable really of asking for help and in finding the right people to advise him. He doesn't seem to have been capable of listening to that advice and he seems to have been, um, I, I, I guess, you know, he seems to have shown himself as a uh, a kind of medieval equivalent to a you know a rich kid gone bad and um, there's just so many examples of that isn't there really so so there we go guys um, that's that's how uh, Tostic Godwinson quite possibly uh, I think the um, one of the key traitors of the Saxon age and without him um, I, I, I think I certainly question whether or not there would have been uh, an invasion take place the way that it did by uh, Duke William or certainly Harold Hadrada. Harold Hadrada was a very smart man, uh, an amazing military leader who's been attributed with many, many, many um, military successes throughout the, the Viking sort of period with the Varangian Guard and the Byzantine Empire and, and so much more. Um, he's, he's a very fascinating person um, and I, I will be doing a, a video on Harold, uh, on Harold Hadrada in the coming days uh, amongst some other ones. So um, there we go guys. Tostic Goodwinson. I really hope you enjoyed today's video. Please like, subscribe and share. I'll catch you in my next video.